one of our uh, five morning panels of farmer, uh, farmer education. I'd like to ask you to uh, find the surveys in your packets and fill those surveys out to volunteers at either of the registration desks um, on this floor. So uh, without too much ado, we are going to begin with our Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Murray Fisher. I'm the co-founder of the Urban Assembly in New York Harbor School, which is a public maritime high school here in New York City located out on wonderful Governor's Island. And uh, my job today is just to let these experts from around the region help us in New York City figure out how are we going to get more young people out on the water. Um, I had an experience yesterday that was so telling. I went to Red Hook to give a quick presentation after school program about the Harbor School, 50 students aged 10 to 16, and before I began to talk about New York Harbor School, I asked the students if they would raise their hands to show me how many students knew about New York Harbor, knew what New York Harbor was. Now one hand went up, and it's just, you know, Red Hook used to be these cities, maritime communities surrounded by water, and I just think that that's a real ex example of the kind of work that we're all doing. What we've done today is we've got panelists from around the region, um, Adam Green from New York City, uh, but some others from around the region who are experts in getting young people on the water in their area, and we want to learn from them how can we work towards a goal, and Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance helped us put this goal together, how can we work towards a goal of putting two million kids on the water, but they left off a date, and so we've decided that as part of the vision 2020, by 2020, that we can say that we had two million young people at meaningful, and I'm borrowing this language from the Chesapeake Bay, meaningful environmental experiences on or related to New York Harbor or the Hudson River Estuary. Um, and so I think that that's a good goal. That's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I'm really uh, grateful for this opportunity to hear all of these experts speak. And we are going to begin, I hope Alicia knows that we will begin with her, um, and so I'd like to introduce Alicia Mullet from Soundwaters, which is located, oh, I'm sorry, you know what? The, the, the late engines. Before we do that, though, we're going to have our, our, our local expert, Betsy Eucharitis from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, sort of set the scene and set the context for the, the harbor and environmental uh, learning in general in New York State, and then we'll go look to the outside experts. Okay, thank you so much, Betsy. Um, the cards you guys are getting passed out are for questions. Write them down, hand them in, and then they'll get set up up here, just so you don't understand that one. Um, just to begin talking about the importance of environmental education and how there is so much research, a lot of us know about that it helps students' behavior, whether it's disciplinary or just their mental um, development. It helps with their physical health and makes them in responsible citizenry. And there's two big um, national level legislations that's going on. There's the National Environmental Education Act that was passed in 1990, 1990 and is ex extended every single year that supports the Office of Environmental Education at the EPA. And their goals are basically to achieve an environmental literate citizenry to cross the age spectrum. Um, but their big ones on how they do that is they developed a multi-partner training program specially, specializing in professional development for educators. They um, have a focus across the age, age spectrum, but their biggest thing that I think all of us have benefited over the years by is their small but strategic state um, or regional grants program and a national grants program. Then you also have the No Child Left Inside Act, uh, that everybody has been hearing about, especially through the Richard Louv movement. And basically that wants to put environmental ed back into the classrooms and provides funding to do so. They have federal funding to put um, for states to train teachers in environmental education and to operate model environmental programs. It also provides states funding that create environmental literacy plans, how to go about creating an environmental literacy or environmentally literate society. Um, to ensure that high school graduates are environmentally literate. Um, it also helps that President Obama has been really pushing the importance of science and math education between holding a science, a national science fair on the mall in DC, holding, hosting summits on science and math education at the White House, 
But how does that relate back to New York State and New York City? The New York State Outdoor Education Association, Scenic Hudson and Audubon New York are the three main lead partners in creating an environmental literacy plan for New York. So that one, when, we all say when, not if, no child left, no child left inside gets passed, New York State will already have the mechanism that it needs to actually start getting the money and bringing it to the states and bring it to New York State so that other organizations that provide environmental ed can access that money. The New York State, all of the partners who have been working on that, the New York State Environmental Literacy Plan, they are going to have a draft for the 2011 New York State Outdoor Ed Association Conference in October of next year. So they're, they're working and it's going really well. They've got a lot of people working on it, state ed, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, state parks, along with a lot of nonprofits. But bringing environmental ed now back to on water and in water, which is the primary focus of this panel, it's a natural fit in New York City if you just take a look around. Um, but having quality environmental education and literate, environmental literate citizens means that we need to have a benchmark so that we can compare the students and see how well they've improved and if they're, they know these main topics. So the Harbor Education Task Force has been batting around having common points, knowledge points, learning points, and what we've termed literacy points now, so that all citizens have to know these main points about New York Harbor. And we've been working on them and writing them. So we took a look at um, some national ones that are out there, the ocean literacy and the climate literacy documents, along with the um, Hudson River Estuary Program's knowledge points about the Hudson River. And we've, as a subcommittee, um, there's been eight of us, and we've all been working to write. And we noticed that our top five, when we all wrote our top five, we had five common topics. So we chose those were as our main ones for right now. We've been working on compiling them and editing them into a current draft that we now have the five Harvard literacy points. And we've done this in about five weeks. Yes, I can crack the whip. We've been working really hard on this. And um, I do have a handout of the Harvard literacy points that we've been working on. They are in extreme draft form and not the latest draft. But our main point for having these literacy points is that they have some vocabulary words for each of them. They have a description of what we want the kids to know and the adults to know. And they also have some take home actions connecting the, their daily lives with New York Harbor. So our main topics are watershed and human connections. Anyone know how many square miles are in the New York Harbor water, New York, New Jersey Harbor watershed? 2,000. 2,000, 10,000. 16,300. How many major rivers are in the watershed? New York and New Jersey? Seven. Um, I gotta put some yeah, good questions. But we also have the living estuary, which is the biological living organisms, the physical estu estuary, which it's gonna highlight. Most people don't realize that it's tidal. Hello, we have a tide, it's the ocean, it's connected. Um, some habitat types. The history of New York, New Jersey Harbor which includes cultural, industrial, and military, because we know that the military was a big thing for being here, we really did. And then our last one, our, main, our fifth main topic is water quality, whether it's stormwater, wastewater, and green infrastructure, it's all in there. So those are our main topics, and yes, you guys can have a handout if you'd like. I have about 49 copies left um, at the end. Okay. okay, perfect, thank you, Betsy. I'm actually, uh, you can imagine how excited we are to get our hands on those five uh, literacy points. So thank you so much for that work, Betsy. Um, so now we will move over to Alicia Mullet from Sound Waters. And could I remind you to be taking notes on your note card if you have a question that you want the panelists to ask at the end. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Yep, and I am going to be your PowerPoint operator. Um, You can just tell me when to click the next slide, and I will. All right, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to learn and share and have great dialogue about getting 
two million kids out and around the water. I'm from Soundwaters. Soundwaters began 20 years ago out of a crisis. Long Island Sound was in a devastated state. Our mission is to protect Long Island Sound through education. Our first year, we had a wonderful and powerful program. There you go. Wonderful and pow powerful program, limited by scale. We only had one ship. At the start of our second decade, through good community partnerships, we acquired a rundown, empty house and restored it to what is now the Coastal Education Center. This has allowed us to grow and evolve while staying true to our mission. Our first year in 1989, we had 15 schools. In 2010, 21 years later, we have 246 schools. What we have found are three key elements that make a successful program. Scale, methods, and communication. We have skills and resources that teachers and schools all need. At Soundwaters, we are a full-time team of 12. Five of those are educators who provide hands-on, inquiry-based education year-round. In 2010, over 15,000 students were reached. But that is not the whole story. Our job, our joy, is to teach and bring Long Island Sound into people's lives. At Soundwaters, we do that at our Coastal Education Center, in our lab, in the field, and at festivals throughout the region. 2010, over 34,000 students, people, <coughs> adults, were reached through Soundwaters. That brings me to scale. What is the right number for you? A couple of questions to ask yourself over and over again. What is the right age? What is the content? How many contact hours for your program? Logistics. This is critical to what we do and how to get 2 million kids on and in the water. But it's not just about the numbers. It's not about an assembly line production. Our programs at Soundwaters are designed and aligned with state science frameworks, and we believe in meaningful experiences, as I'm sure you all do. At Soundwaters, it's not a field trip, it's a field study. Our approach can be distilled into three key elements, scale, methods, and communication. But our goal is to provide every person with a meaningful experience, a memorable impact, and rigor that is challenging both intellectually and physically. We offer a variety of programs. Just to quickly show you, this is aboard our schooner Soundwaters. It's three contact hours. It's a riveting and transformative experience for all that take part. In the classroom, there are multidisciplinary programs that range from a climate change experiment to animal adaptations with live animals. Our after school programs are both time and content intensive. It's a combination of field and classroom activities that range with responsibility including maintaining an aquarium full of aquatic life. What I want to talk a little bit more about is a successful district-wide program in the Long Island Sound watershed, the Soundwaters Long Island Sound watershed experience. Every eighth grader in Stanford participated in this program. It took place over the school year, in the classroom, at the river, and in the Long Island Sound. This was a true team effort from the mayor to the superintendent, to the teachers, to the district science coordinator, and the students. Students were all in the same playing field and got to do something that most, if not all, had never done before. Using scientific equipment, we brought science to life and students were able to learn how to do it. Five Soundwaters educators took, spent a total of 16 hours with every student over 59 days. At this point, weather is the only thing I can't control. <laughs> Every eighth grader was able to participate in our hands-on scientific inquiry-based program, regardless of gender, school rank, teacher, level, or physical ability. We were able to make sure that every student received the same experiential learning. However, none of this could have happened without communication. Building relationships takes time. I'm sure you've all thought that it's easy to just walk in and you know the superintendent and say, I have this great program and I really want to implement it. We know it's not usually that the same. Just like a house that can withstand the elements, a successful program starts with a solid foundation. We, fo we found must go building by building, teacher by teacher, school by school, and find your champion that can help rally through. Developing and nurturing your relationships brings more teachers, which leads to more kids, more family, more parents, aware of your contribution and enhancement.
transmit to the school's curriculum, which will only make it easier for the next time and the goal of getting 2 million kids on and in the water. Stay true to your mission, but keep adapting and growing. We all know kids learn differently. It's not a one-size-fits-all world by any means. At Soundwaters, each moment is a chance to create the memory that will last a lifetime. By working together in a meaningful, resonating way, growing with the times, we can reach that goal of 2 million kids in and on the water. opportunity to bring people together uh, out on the water that they would be inspired by what they experienced and they would want to work together to protect it and that is exactly what has happened um, since 1969 uh, since since 1969 over 400,000 kids have experienced the Hudson River and New York Harbor on board Clearwater uh, we run the classroom of the weeds program now not only aboard Clearwater but we also charter up the mystic whaler um, during our spring season in order to meet increased demands. Um, and I love this picture. We take uh, up to 50 kids a day, twice a day, for three hours at a time, and uh, those kids get to help raise the sail. Uh, they go fishing, and then we break them up into small groups, and they rotate through these hands-on learning stations. This is uh, a mechanical advantage station. Um, they have, we also have a life station on board where whatever we pull out of our trawl net goes into a touch tank, and then the kids can interact with those living creatures. I just love that this kid is wearing a suit. <laughs> we should all dress up sometimes on board the boat. We also offer water chemistry testing. Um, that's a former educator holding a sturgeon that we pulled up in our trauma. Um, and another, uh, this is an example of invasive species. These are uh, super mussels. We talk a lot about how species uh, in the Hudson interact and uh, how human impacts can affect the entire ecosystem ways that we can work together to preserve those ecosystems. Um, we also offer music on board the Clearwater that's uh, part of Pete Seeger's legacy we're trying to keep that alive. All of our stations meet New York State learning standards in math, science, and technology, social studies, English, English language arts, um, and fine arts. And uh, we really work to communicate with teachers before the sale to, uh, to tailor the program to their individual needs so that what they learn on board during that three-hour sale, they can then, then take back to the classroom and they can build on what they've experienced. Uh, in addition to these three-hour sales, we also offer youth empowerment programs. This was our eighth year of Young Women at the Helm. Um, this is a program for at-risk youth from the greater New York area. Um, this program focuses on maritime education, environmental education as a means of empowerment. Uh, this was our second year of Young Men at the Helm, too. And uh, I don't know if you can see, but um, some of our panelists might actually recognize some faces in the crowd. Um, on the right there is George Bo Fields. He's a Harvard School student. Um, he's got this gray bottle. He's uh, providing us with clear water air conditioning. It was 102 that day. 
Um, up top is Carlos Duran. He's a graduate of the Rock and Boat program. Um, he was also a deckhand on Clearwater and an education intern. And he's um, also doing some environmental activist work with Clearwater. He was part of the America's Great Outdoors uh, campaign recently with the Department of the Interior. Um, this is another uh, former student of, of ours, um, Adriani. She was a, a young woman at the helm and then she went on to be a volunteer and then an education intern. Um, and now she's working as an environmental educator in the San Francisco Bay Area. I, I'm going to skip over because just for time. But uh, this graph shows a breakdown of uh, groups that we serve in the Hudson Valley and, and the New York area. And you can see that about 50% of the groups that we serve come from New York City. Uh, well, that's actually including Yonkers. Um, and this is a picture of us docked at uh, Red Hook. This is one of two docks in New York City. We also dock at 79th Street Boat Basin. And uh, we're hoping to, uh, we're intending to expand our docks. Uh, hopefully next year we will be all, also be at 125th Street. Um, and that will allow us greater access to areas like Harlem and um, in the Bronx, and hopefully um, there'll be more opportunities in the future with Eco Docs to expand um, our access to New York City. Thank you very much.
five <coughs> intensive job skills programs, sort of about 48 um, uh, school-based on water classroom programs, which I think are most consistent with many of the programs other folks uh, on this panel run. Um, uh, serve about a thousand in our community road program, which is uh, show up and go rowing uh, every Saturday from May to September, uh, serves about 1,500 uh, people. The majority of them are high school age students, uh, will be uh, expanded into middle school during the school day, uh, and then adults can take part in, uh, in all of our, our community programs. Um, we work with uh, about 25 different schools, and that's sort of a, a, a varying number year to year. Uh, we both work directly with schools in the context of our school-based programs, and then directly with kids who then introduce us to their schools many times. Um, um, a quick rundown of our programs. I should point out that uh, in the background here is our new shop, we just moved in, in in March. We have a 6,000 square foot uh, workspace now with a 2,500 square foot of shop. Um, and uh, up front is actually a, a boat where we started the summer finishing up this fall, and we're going to be launching this winter in the Catskills on a frozen lake. It's an ice boat. Um, so that's going to be a really, really exciting thing. Um, the goal of our after school aid development program is, is to help students gain self confidence, greater sense of self worth, uh, graduate from high school, and start on a path to a successful life. So I think quite differently from the academic based programs, our goals are not defined by uh, standards. Uh, in fact, the measure the outcome of our, of our work is challenging because it's really looking way ahead in the kids' lives and seeing what, what kind of impact we've had and what they've accomplished. Um, that can be uh, going to Sumo Maritime and, and becoming an a environmental scientist or ship captain that can be uh, working uh, in a blue collar job and be able to support your family. Those are both incredibly successfully met goals in our lives. Uh, the program is divided into boat building and on water. Uh, 16 boat building students build one real boat every semester. 20 on water program participants uh, do a range of environmental science and maritime skills. Um, maritime skills means everything you need to know in order to safely use a boat sailing boat handling, rowing, uh, navigation, CPR first aid, swimming education. Uh, we want to kind of pull in it as much as we possibly can to, to give these kids the deep experience as possible. And then we use all those skills to do a whole range of environmental science work that we do in conjunction with a range of professional scientists. We've got about 10 scientific partners now. And all of the scientific work we do is directly related to larger scientific goals that our, our partners have defined. So nothing that we're doing in any way from all of rocking the boat is just because it's fun. It's all directly related to something that's real and necessary and practical to have extra on it. Um, um, there are two 13 week sessions of um, our sailboats out in the Bronx River. Um, you don't need to know anything or be anyone other than roughly of high school age. You don't even need to be in school. Um, and uh, we try to keep kids on us for as long as we can. Um, we have kids who you know, go through different levels of the program. Uh, spend up to five years with us. Uh, we have two social workers on staff, one of them works specifically with these well. Um, the job skills program is the next step up. It's our, our most senior level uh, program. Uh, uh, 16 kids are hired, uh, paid uh, minimum wage job. Uh, about 25 cent raises are offered every semester uh, to do a very intensive level of environmental science work. It's kind of a top end of our environmental science um, involvement. Uh, this is our job skills. Uh, Science lab, um, and um, and then they are also uh, in the boat building shop uh, doing uh, boat repair and restoration of our own fleet. Uh, it's about 2,700 people, small boats. That's a lot of maintenance to do. But we also do commissions, as I was mentioning before, for outside clients. Um, the all water classroom program um, is is what we do during the school day with schools. A uh, thousand people are served. Um, I think what's unique about them is they are multiple session programs. So we work with the same group of kids between generally three in the semester, 13 sessions over the course of each semester. Um, we do very, very intensive uh, curriculum development with teachers in a very custom way of what they want to focus on. Um, they learn a whole uh, sort of basic range of boat handling and environmental science, um, but they also do very specific stuff depending on the different criteria that teachers have. So it's been a really neat way to serve a lot of kids, um, but also maintain a pretty intensive level of service and, and very much directly conjunction with teachers priorities. And these programs um, are free if there is a grant that supports them and they range up about five hundred dollars a session. It's actually provided a really good earning income for that of course to go. Um, our community rowing program is just to come out and go rowing every Saturday from May to September. Um, about fifteen hundred people were served this year. Um, it's become a, a big addition to the normal birthday parties that are held on Twitter 
motorcycle park. <laughs> um, and uh, once a uh, Rough Riders motorcycle rail. But hey, uh, they all had a great time. Um, and uh, we also have lots of community celebrations. This is a boat launch of uh, rain a couple years ago. Uh, we have mid-semester parents night events and mid-semester boat launches. Um, and, and just tons and tons of opportunities for parents to really get involved and connect with what they're doing. Uh, it's that much deeper level of engagement that we feel is going to sustain much, much longer term. Um, this is the, uh, the, this, the front of our new building on this point. Uh, it's really been just a thrill to be there. Uh, right behind us is the yard and then the park and then the rock service. We walk right through it and we're out that off the water. Um, Great, thank you very much, Adam, and we will move on down to Baltimore and have a presentation from Lisa Jones from the Living Classrooms Foundation. Hi there, thanks for inviting me up here. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint because the technology I never get along, so I probably won't be quite as organized on the slide. Um, Living Classrooms Foundation is a ginormous organization at this point. It started just about 25 years ago with one teacher at a private school in the Baltimore area. It's kind of like, huh, we have a bay. We should have a boat. We should teach about the bay. So kids helped chop down the first tree, and kids have been involved ever since. Um, so we did just complete our 24th year of running programs, primarily on the Patapsico River in Baltimore City, but we will also travel all around the bay, and any other time of year, we've been in New York, we go all the way up close to me. Um, the foundation in general, besides just our shipboard department, to give you a quick overview, like I said, it's big. We're now up to over 300 full-time employees. Um, in the summertime, we skyrocket over five or 600 with part-time. We now have a branch down in D.C. as well. It's pretty much replicating everything that we do in Baltimore, plus some of their own things. Um, like I said, I'm from the shipboard department, which I'll come back to in a second. We have a big after-school program um, that's continually rated one of the best in the state and one of the top performing after-school programs in the country. We have the Fresh Start program, which when Adam's this boat building, that's where it started from. Um, we had this boat, we had to build a boat, so we had kids help us build a boat, and then it continued to go. Um, and that's called the Fresh Start program. It is continually rated one of the top 10 programs in the country for adjudicated teenage boys, and there's all kinds of follow-up and job placement services. Um, for the past, oh, I don't know, six or seven years, we've been running Crossroads School, which is a Baltimore City charter middle school. And just this past year, Baltimore City approached us and said, you're doing such a great job. When uh, our eighth graders graduate, 90% of them are going to private prep schools in the area. They're all on scholarships, and most of them all for now look like they're in, entering private colleges as well. They said, you're doing so great. We want you to run this worst performing school that happens to be in your neighborhood. So just this year, we've taken over a, uh, another Baltimore City public school, K through eighth grade. So that's lots of exciting challenges. Um, that's sort of our educational world. And then we have a whole other side, and everything is based around education. Um, we have the Project Serve, which, for lack of a better way to describe it, is sort of a Habitat for Humanity AmeriCorps program. We are working with adults who are re-entering the system for whatever reason, and they're AmeriCorps up to two years, um, doing a lot of cleaning and boarding of houses, vacant houses, we have contracts with the city, maintaining parks, community centers, things like that. Um, and then we have this whole touristy side as well. So we have a hand in the Baltimore Maritime Museum, which are historic ships in Baltimore, which um, So that's four ships and a lighthouse in the Baltimore Harbor. We have a very close partnership with Fort McHenry, which I'll let you know. Coming up, we have a annual. You'll see all kinds of celebrations coming to Baltimore in some special <laughs> manner. Um, and we also have the first Baltimore City Urban Nature Center. Masonville Cove, which was a restoration project, um, a report for dredging spoils. They um, agreed to work with the community in order for dumping their dredged spoils. They are now have they've built this first urban nature center. It's a totally green building. Um, and we also have just recently opened the Frederick Douglass Isaac Myers Maritime Museum, which is a tribute to African American maritime history and stands in the place where the first black owned shipyard in the country was. So there's a lot happening in the big classroom but back to support department. Um, we started with the Lady Maryland, the boat that students helped build. It's a company screener, the world's only one. Traditional Chesapeake Bay work boat. And at our highest point, we had four ships operating. We had Lady Maryland, we had two skipjacks, we had a bi-boat. 
Um, sadly, with changes in Coast Guard regulations and capacity counts and the current state of the budget and the world, we're down to two boats, just Lady Maryland and our Steve Jack CP. Um, that doesn't stop us. We generally, with four boats, which serves somewhere over 10,000 students a year. Um, now, this fall is the first time we've operated with just two vessels, but in our season, which is March through November this year, we still serve over 5,000 students. Um, our typical trip is about a five-hour program, so a little bit longer than theirs, but similar program. Um, water quality, navigation, marine life. Um, again, we are not an advocacy group. We are not you know, solely environmental education. We're trying to make the students well-rounded. So we'll ask them, like, if you're sailing past the Port of Baltimore right here, you see the industry. Yeah, we just held the fish that were here, and they need to live here, but we kind of need this industry. This is one of the top 10 ports on the East Coast. How do we find a balance? We serve students fourth grade and above from any place we can get them. Home schools, private schools, public schools, um, religious, you know, Catholic schools, whatever it might be. Mostly private school, fourth to sixth graders are what we get. In the summertime, we have a great partnership with Johns Hopkins University. They run the CTY program, which is the Center for Talent and Youth. Um, and so we will be out for 10 days with students. Uh, our smaller boats will stay on the bay, studying a bay ecology program at Camping Shore in the evenings. Lady Maryland sailed right on past here, all the way up to New England Coast, studying whales and estuaries with students living on board. Um, and then, like I said, in the fall, we'll travel around the bay to serve students who can't make the trip to Baltimore. We do manage to serve students from every county in Maryland for our programs. So how do we do all this? Uh, pretty busy, we're pretty tired. But we have been fortunate enough that when we started 25 years ago, we were sort of a new human town. Nobody had a program really running like this. So we were able to get into not only Baltimore City school system, and honestly, Baltimore City is probably the hardest to get into, but we were able to get into the state Department of Education pretty easily. And all of our programs have always been aligned with um, now it's a voluntary state for film, we call it. So, um, so all of our programs meet those goals. We have had teachers change schools, I don't know how many times, teachers have been coming out with us for 15, 18 years. So fortunately we have a lot of complete clientele at this point, but there is not an empty day in the books. If you know, we have anything open, word of mouth is, at this point it's basically word of mouth, we've been around long enough. We have a reputation of student, teachers want their students to come out with us. We also kind of tell you to leave a child left behind. Maryland is part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. What does anybody know? How many square miles of Chesapeake Bay watershed? Mm. 64,000 square miles, six states, and Washington, D.C., so we're a little bit larger. Those states got together in the 1980s and created the Chesapeake Bay Agreement, which is an agenda of lots of things to restore the bay. Education is a key component. So when that agreement was revamped, they said every street in the watershed that's 64,000 square miles needs to have a um, authentic watershed experience. It could be water, it could be mountains, it could be whatever. So our parents are doing direct to the Association of Outdoor and Environmental Education Board, and believe it or not, Maryland 
It has the largest environmental education conference in the country, um, held every February. We're a tiny state, but we have somewhere between five and 600 participants for the weekend conference. It'll be February, if anybody wants to go, pass along information. Um, but we have gotten ahead of the curve on this, and so we were the first ones in the country with our environmental literacy plan in, which is only going to make us busier, which is my senior's plan. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of great things to have, and you guys are on the right track. Great. Uh, thank you. We're going to move up to Coach. Thank you very much. We'll move up the coast to Megan Rent from the Bayshore Discovery Project in New Jersey. Uh, to you trust me, Megan? I trust Oh, yeah. Context of where Bayshore Discovery Project is, and how many of you have been to Bob Out, New Jersey? Okay, we have a few in the room. Um, so there you have us down in the Delaware Bay, and after spending um, about 10 years with the Delaware Estuary Program, which came after the Chesapeake Bay Program, I'm accustomed to going after the Chesapeake Bay and always being a little bit in the shadow. They've got a, a lot going on there, and I'm not going to be able to bring anything to the table related to scale like Lisa was. So, um, but we can comment on um, programs, and I'd like to think of our organization as not just a you know, outside expert from away, but we come to the New Jersey, New York Harbor, excuse me, New York, New Jersey Harbor, I guess you call it, <laughs> um, yeah. every summer. So, um, you know, we're happy to be part of getting those two million kids on the water. Um, and um, our, just to give some context for where we're from, it looks a little bit different down there. This is a typical Bayshore view. And uh, we have internationally significant wetlands for the, uh, that act as habitat for some of the largest, you know, biodiversities in the world, even. And um, it's just an amazing place. And not just environmentally, but historically, this is uh, a shot taken at the turn of the last century. The maritime history of the region is just phenomenal. And I'm sure most of you probably. Um, that's probably not the first thing that you think of when you think of New Jersey. And, um, you know, we often have a bit to, like an uphill battle to um, share the richness of the environment and culture and history of the region that we serve predominantly, especially during the school year. This is an aerial photograph taken of the Morris River, spelled Maurice, but pronounced Morris down in Cumberland County. And I don't know if you can tell, but those are all scooters along the riverfront. And uh, there were as many as, um, well, there were over 500 licenses for oystering. This was the oyster capital of the world, um, so we called it. Um, and it was um, 80 train cars a day leaving the area filled with oysters. And it's just hard to imagine um, the, you know, the incredible richness of the resource and the booming economy, especially when you look at what it's like today. And it's a working waterfront. Many of the same schooners that were out there oystering in the 1920s are now oystering under power. Um, and it's an amazing place if you're ever kind of taking a jaunt and want to check out Bivalve, I would welcome you to come on down. Um, this is the typical views when we're doing our school programs from our home port. And we actually can still work from the building that was in that historic aerial photograph that you saw that had the, um, you know, all the train, the box cars leaving filled with oysters. That's a 1904 building that's on the National Register of Historic Places that we're currently restoring to do, you know, much like up at Soundwaters, we're adding um, a capacity to our ability to move, you know, more kids through our programs by having a, a shore-based facility, and um, we. Um, we basically, through education, preservation, and example, we teach people, motivate people to take care of the history, culture, and environment of New Jersey's Bayshore region. We do that through our festival. We started even before the Mirrorwald was our flagship. This was Delaware Bay Days, and 
Um, we also, uh, at that facility that you saw at the shipping sheds, um, there's a contiguous 4,000 acre wetlands and we do shore-based programming and um, uh, getting kids on and in the water in addition to the shipboard programs that we have. This year we um, had our inaugural season of uh, Girl Scout Jamboree that we we're going to be adding to the menu of programs that we offer. And we also have a little lake nearby where we have our small boat program. We've started building boats and having programs on Lake Audrey. The tide is um, a little bit intense on the Morris River, so it's um, a little safer and um, easier to manage the programs on Lake Audrey down the road. Um, and on to the Mirwald, which is our, as I said, our flagship. She was built in 1928. Um, a lot of the vessels are replicas or you know um, approximations of historic vessels, but she's the real deal. 1928 on the National Register, and um, after eight-year restoration, she was named uh, New Jersey's official tall ship in 1998. And we're sort of proud that it's a you know she's not as tall as some of the big square riggers, but she's a working boat built uh, you know a vessel type that was very you know indigenous to to South Jersey and an important vessel type for the. Um, you know, for the really the history of the country, and um, we're thrilled to move around through New Jersey, um, taking kids out. And our programs are very similar to the ones that you've seen on the other vessels. That's um, although um, I, I suppose most of the vessels that are represented here um, are place-based, and that's a big part of what we are compared to some others. That you know, it's very much about the um, the waters that the kids are on, um, and. There's, uh, it's, it's hands-on, experiential uh, education. We um, have uh, science and uh, history and observation, um, keep and math. Uh, and I should point out that our um, shipboard program coordinator um, happens to be in this picture and in the back of the room, uh, joining us here today, another Megan. Um, and um, key to the core curriculum standards for New Jersey. Um, we also do a lot of uh, youth development. You know, I think a lot of us, our goals are not just to, you know, transfer facts and figures, but to have uh, empowered, you know, youth when they leave our programs. And um, I think that the work that, uh, you know, we work on teamwork, we work on um, self-confidence, communications, responsibility and accountability, building stewardship, and um, personal connections. A lot of what we do is uh, focused on the watershed and whichever watershed we're in is you know, where we, we tie our, our programs to the watershed that we're in and um, try to make that personal connection so that the students feel as though they have um, a level of accountability to their own watershed. Um, it's not that they're just coming out on the boat to go visiting somewhere. It, there's a connection to um, their own home. Um, we um, have our typical three-hour sale, similar to a lot of the groups represented here. Uh, we also do um, some, we have some after-school programs, we have um, summer camps and uh, day-long day camps in the summertime. And in contrast to the, um, some of the larger cities, if you think about bivalve and you saw it placed on the you know the aerial view of, of New Jersey, um, our zip code isn't obviously the worst in the in the country, but it's um, it, it's pretty it's pretty economically depressed down there, and it's also pretty di dispersed. There are 560 school districts in New Jersey, and uh, basically, if you make a relationship, there was a lot said about the importance of relationships with individual teachers. When you make a relationship with one district, you've basically you're taking a class or two, and then you have to move on and develop a relationship with you know more of the 560 some districts out there. So it's a little difficult in New Jersey, um, at least at the end of it where we are. I mean, if we were focused on perhaps Jersey City, it would be a different story, and we could make a relationship with the district and have a bigger impact. But we spend a lot of time. Um, you know, building school by school relationships, and that's a little more challenging. Um, and I think that uh, some of the areas that we serve have issues with 
Um, you know, there's an entire county that has the largest cities in our region that's not allowed to take a water-based field trip in their school. So if we had a goal, for instance, like you have here, we would need to work after school and outside of the, um, you know, the formal education system to achieve it. So it's fortunate that that's not the situation here and you have a scale where you can work in the districts and um, I think there's a, a lot of um, hope to be able to meet your goals here from that perspective. And um, our programs, we, uh, our school sales are typically in the Delaware River and Bay in the spring and summertime we move on and um, we have summer day camps, day long camps and week long camps and the, there we have smaller groups of kids that stay on for a whole week and we often are starting, we actually spend July and um, could potentially spend part of August up in this area. There's a summer camp um, leaving Liberty State Park and um, we are in this region uh, sailing, we head up, spend a little bit of time up in Alpine, and last year we went to Yonkers for the first time. Um, but we're um, um, up in this area, and uh, really, a lot of times we're doing, um, uh, we sail from this area down to Cape May, and um, we have some partnerships with nonprofit organizations that use the schooner for fundraisers and education programs of their own. And uh, that's something that um, the partnership aspect is really important. And I think that especially uh, trying to reach um, kids in the summertime, there are a lot of vessels that are here in the harbor that you know to reach two million. I think you know you really have to have a lot of boat capacity, and probably you know everybody represented here would need to be engaged, and others too. Um, so I think there and there are others with the boats that aren't education focused but sail out of the harbor so I think there'd be some uh, to me it's an interesting concept to think about having your key points that um, are developed for the harbor and to think about utilizing those on other um, waterborne opportunities even the ferries and the boat that we went on this morning you know our opportunity is not quite as rich perhaps as the experience that you would have on one of Adam's rowboats but you know I think that um, Lisa was saying on a conference call earlier that in Maryland, it's not just the, all the kids in one year, but every year of their, um, of their high school or their, um, their school career is they're mandated to have an on-the-water type experience. So I think that um, you know, not being discriminatory about getting them on the water might be one way to um, you know, really boost the results. Um, and um, we're thrilled with the time that we spend up this way and would um, love to be part of helping to get those two million kids on the water, especially in the summertime. And um, I just wanted to leave you with um, a favorite quote of mine and of Bayshore Discovery Projects, and I think it's um, valid to this um, endeavor also. And you know, Margaret Mead's quote that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I think you've got a great group of committed folks. I'm really um, inspired by the goals that you have and hope to be part of helping to achieve them. questions also in case you don't pass any up. We would love to hear what your questions are. We came prepared. Um, this is one of them, whoever wrote that, thank you. Um, so actually, why? Do you mind if I go ahead and get started on just a question about talking about the barriers? You know, this, this two million, I mean, the idea of two million young people on the water you know, we just now came up with by 2020, there are 1.1 million public school kids in New York City. So that gives you a big chunk of where that could come from. And then you have New Jersey, um, and then you obviously have all the other kids, the private school kids and, and Catholic school kids, and all the other groups of young people that we want to get on the water. So that's where our two million came from. But what I'd like to know, um, maybe from each panelist, is what do people see 
as the largest barrier to trying to get young people on the water in New York City, in New York Harbor, in the New Jersey, New York area. What, what do people see as the largest barrier to doing that from your own experience? I'll start with that. Um, we, like I said before, some of our coastal education center and our biggest logistical problem is transportation, getting the children to the water. Even though we are based on Long Island Sound in Fairfield County, it's very difficult. As you all know, I'm sure school budgets everywhere are getting cut. Transportation is expensive. So we work with many counties, New York and Connecticut, and transportation is a very Can that fall under, if we weren't in New York City, can that kind of fall under access, or is it different because in New York City you have subways to get you to <laughs> Our subways are free, but we have we have for school, for school for during school time. How do students get to rock in the boat? At? Uh, groups uh, during the school day generally come by subway. Uh, there's also availability of school buses. Um, the school bus drivers sit around in the morning and the afternoon. Do you want to say, Nina, what you think the biggest barrier? Go ahead. Yep. Uh, I think the biggest barrier um, to get kids on board Clearwater right now is probably funding. Um, a sale of Clearwater costs twelve fifty for for three hours on board the boat. We do uh, completely subsidize Title One schools, um, but I I would say that funding is probably the issue, and uh, teachers finding time. Um, so I think that that, that change is really going to come through um, standards reform and curriculum development. Um, and when we see this as a real priority, environmental education, then um, principals and supervisors will start to find the money to get kids out of the river so that they can have that meaningful experience. Um, in, in the context of, of out-of-school programs, I'd say the biggest barrier is awareness.